Facebook. So I'll start now. So hello and namaste everyone. I am Pravis from Isatya. I'd like to welcome you all in this event. Uh, so we are here today with the theme of uh, blockchain in uh, fintech. This meetup is organized by Isatya, an initiative by Rumson Associates and Blockchain Foundation Nepal. So it is supported by Prime IT Club, CSIT Association of Nepal, and Digital Notice India. So talking about Isatya, Isatya is a blockchain-based company in Nepal that specializes in developing blockchain-based products, as well as consulting about blockchain technology through various blockchain sessions, fellowship opportunities, and uh, so on. And uh, here is an example of uh, the meetup itself. So uh, talking about uh, our uh, supportive partners, Blockchain Foundation Nepal is a non-for-profit non uh, community that aims to create blockchain ecosystem by supporting blockchain enthusiasts and blockchain, blockchain innovations in Nepal. So likewise, Digital Notice India, Digital Notice Media Lab is a premier media agency offering a hub of top-notch media services for blockchain technology related platforms in India. So. Prime IT Club is a student club of prime colleges dedicated to empowering IT knowledge. And lastly, CSIT Association of Nepal is a non-profitable social organization of CSIT students that acts as a bridge between the faculty, students, and IT industries of Nepal. So now let's move on into our meetup, Blockchain in Fintech. The main mission of this meetup is to let everyone know about the importance of blockchain and how it can uplift the fintech industry. So to highlight the initiation, as well as to get the proper knowledge from the industry expert, Isatya has the, themed this blockchain meetup 30 to be this premises. So we'll like to, uh, we will also keep the floor open to a healthy discussion at the end of the event. So we have separated 20 minutes for each speakers. If you have any queries, please write them, write them down in the comment section or, uh, or, or chat box. So we'll discuss it at the end of the event. And uh, also, we'll be going live through our uh, Isatya's Facebook page, so uh, you can comment over there too. So uh, without further ado, let's start our meetup with our first speaker, Mr. Anand Avinasi, who is a fintech professional specializing in blockchain, DeFi, and cryptocurrencies with over 10 years of ex experience in IT and fintech. Presently, he is working as a project manager at Ethnesis uh, AI. So uh, sorry for if I mispronounced it. So he wants to create an optimum regulatory framework for blockchain, which allows people and companies to understand it better without compromising the required security. So allow me to welcome Anandji. And so now you can take over. Hey, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction, Pravesh. Uh, really glad to be a part of this forum and uh, given the opportunity to speak about uh, blockchain and fintech uh, this is something that is uh, really close to close to me uh, both fintech and and in blockchain i am also like you know uh, riding the wave of uh, blockchain uh, learning everything uh, whatever new developments are happening and i'm sure like uh, the, the people who have participated today in today's session they are also uh, they they have an idea of what uh, blockchain is and what fintech is so uh, before I start my talk, so like I, I will be talking on uh, blockchain in fintech. Uh, let me just uh, break it into two parts, uh, uh, fintech and blockchain. So, uh, let's discuss something about fintech first. Uh, what, do, what do we understand by the term fintech? What, what is exactly, what exactly fintech is? So uh, fintech is, uh, it's, in, uh, it's a short for financial technology. Uh, let me give you an example. Say like 10 years uh, ago, till, till 10 years ago, uh, we used to frequent uh, banks and uh, financial institutions to uh, apply for loans, to do any sort of credit transaction or like deposit money, withdraw money, uh, passbook update, uh, requesting for a uh, uh, checkbook. So these were the things which I, I think uh, most of our uh, people from our parents' generation would have done that. But in the last, uh, say, six, seven years or five years of, the, the, of, of a lesser time as well, uh, there has been a flourishing increase, a flourishing a flourish in the rise of apps, uh, financial apps. Uh, banking has become, has, has come close to everybody, like uh, through their phones, mobile banking, internet banking. It has really given the, uh, the, the user the uh, power to, you know, uh, just operate their banks through their fingertips. 
so technology has made it possible so this integration of technology within the financial ecosystem is what has given rise to this term financial technology so you must have seen like the uh, like, like no not just finance industry but uh, say uh, there are multiple industries which have been using tech and uh, now new terms are being coined on that like fintech reg tech ed tech so the this is what the uh, current uh, wave of technology is doing it's like uh, giving the power back to the consumer and making it uh, the, the entire process the traditional the legacy systems easier to operate so that you no know, everybody has uh, easy access quicker and faster access to the services so uh, in, in that's what uh, fin financial technology is about uh, apart from the banking industry technology has also touched upon other facets of uh, finance industry as in uh, like uh, we we have all come across multiple uh, websites or apps which help in, uh, in investment put in investing into mutual funds and portfolios uh, there are plethora of tools like uh, machine learning artificial intelligence which can help the users to you know uh have a better understanding of how the market is going and then uh, advise them on a on a uh, on a larger scale to invest in better uh, schemes so this is how technology is helping uh, or uh, this is how technology is uh, shaping up the uh, finance industry i think it's it's the right call you know given the uh, given the advancements in technology makes more sense to use technology which is available to us to fine tune increase the efficiency increase the usability of such uh, platforms secondly i'd like to talk about blockchain i'm sure uh, everybody present here have some sort of an idea of what blockchain is uh, these days uh, blockchain uh, terms like you know, we we have would have come across terms like blockchain bitcoin ethereum uh, decentralization these kind of terms have become the buzzwords these days you know uh, be it any sort of a gathering be it an official gathering or a social gathering or say you know uh, dining out with family or friends uh, these these are the kind of buzzwords that you know anybody can uh, initiate a conversation with and uh, you you'll obviously you'll always find people who can uh, uh, who would actually you know uh, relate to it and start uh, start a discussion on that just give me a second i'll also uh, meanwhile just share my screen give me a moment so yeah so yeah so these these are the buzzwords that have become the uh, as i would like to say these have become the uh, new colloquials of our current generation like they are, they are the ice breakers like uh, depending upon it, it's not uh, necessary that everybody has a positive or a negative outlook but yeah like depending upon uh, the uh, outlook everybody would have an opinion on it so blockchain has actually uh, touched upon multiple lives and everybody knows about bitcoin what ethereum is everybody is aware of that so that's what our topic for today is uh, blockchain in fintech so this is how i've designed my session for today uh, i'll be talking briefly about blockchain i'll give you a brief introduction what blockchain is uh, then i will take you through two use cases uh, where blockchain has touched uh, and made an impact in the financial industry what problem did it solve and how is it uh, how did it solve it? so the first thing let's address it what is blockchain would anybody want to put in the comment section uh, anybody want to go ahead i'd like to keep this interactive so that you no know, it's uh, it's easier for uh, all of us to be on the same page and uh, i i do not just rush away with my slides okay so let let me start again so if i put it simply uh, blockchain is nothing but a chain of blocks uh, it's it's a long chain of blocks wherein each block is uh, related to the previous block through a cryptographic hash 
blockchain is a distributed ledger technology which is decentralized in nature now what do i mean by uh, distributed ledger technology uh, let us take an example say all of us uh, who are uh, present in this uh, on this call we are participants in a blockchain network say once the transaction is put on a block once the transaction is live on the blockchain so that becomes a ledger and that all of the participants that we are uh, we all would have access to the same information so instead of having our own set of information our own uh, set of ledger information that won't be the case but whatever is there on the blockchain we will all have the same distributed shared system so blockchain any information on blockchain becomes the single source of truth so this is how it is a uh, distributed ledger technology and secondly it is decentralized with in by which i mean uh, there is no central authority which governs the network say the all the participants have equal weighted and equal rights equal privileges so there is nobody who is who can govern or who can you know, uh, uh, get an offset on the system so it is a uh, dlt and decentralized system of course it is a it is the digital platform behind all the uh, bitcoins ethereum uh, all the different cryptocurrencies but according to me uh, if you just pass through this uh, layer of cryptocurrency uh, there is a lot more that blockchain offers for me uh, personally there are three things which stand out when i talk about blockchain uh, it is fast it is efficient and it is secure how does it how does blockchain uh, comprise of all these uh, features the answer lies in uh, as i just discussed it is uh, a decent it is a distributed ledger technology say uh, again going back to the example we all are part of a blockchain network and we all want uh, to publish a transaction on the network so the first thing to publish the uh, publish any sort of a transaction on the block is that we we'll all have to reach a consensus unless in otherwise uh, we reach a consensus that everybody agrees that no uh, everybody is okay with what is what is being uh, uh, written in the ledger it cannot happen we we cannot publish a transaction on blockchain so consensus is the first property that we all have to reach a consensus for the transaction to realize on blockchain second when once the transaction is there on blockchain it cannot be tampered it cannot be altered it cannot be reversed it becomes immutable so immutability is the second factor once the transaction is there on blockchain it stays there for good you cannot change it ever so it, let's say even like you know uh, you you we've done a transaction today and uh, 10 years down the line we want to check the transaction that we have done today we can always come back and check that so that is the finality and the provenance factor of it so these four like uh, consensus uh, provenance finality and immutability these four are the basic cornerstones of any blockchain network that would be uh, about blockchain and now i will take you to the use cases in the financial industry so uh, here i have taken two uh, use cases i have taken i have touched upon uh, global payments like uh, cross border remittances and settlements and the second uh, use case that i have taken is uh, central bank digital currency let's start with global payments so ibm came up with this product called ibm blockchain word wire so let's uh, let me uh, take you through an example say uh, all of us would have someone or the other in our family or say in our acquaintances wherein you no know, or say just you as well uh, you working in the uk you work uh, for like 10 hours 12 hours or maybe 14 hours just slogging it uh, to earn money and send it back to your home country to your family to your parents to your wife or for, for to to anybody in your family. but when you go to the bank it says like you no know, for every transaction that you do first it takes a good amount of good chunk of money as transfer charges and then it also takes around 2 to 3 days for the transaction to realize you no know? uh, for you if you if you say give an instruction to your bank in the uk today uh, say your family in india or uh, in nepal would receive the money after a couple of days they can receive the money 
uh, by the end of day. And for every uh, transaction, you pay end up paying a hefty amount as transaction charges. There are some problems with the traditional global pay payments. Uh, as I mentioned, it's slow. Uh, it, it generally takes two to three days. What happens in case of an emergency? You know, uh, there is a medical emergency. There is a uh, there, there is a wedding or there is some sort of emergency wherein uh, you, you need to send money right away. But uh, it will take its own sweet time. It, it cannot happen uh, right, right, uh, uh, right on the same day. It is complicated. Given the paper trail, given the uh, number of people involved in the transfer, say every bank, you go to a bank, go to the bank, you fill up the form, you give the instruction, there is a maker and a checker process. There is a approver, there is a maker. Say the approver is busy in a meeting or say perhaps uh, not in the office today. You lose a day. That's no, you, you can't do anything in that. And it is expensive, not just from the perspective of, you know, uh, the transfer charges you pay, but effort-wise, you know, you will have to go to the bank, you spend some time in the queue, then all, all these efforts, all these uh, things add up to the effort too. Now, before I move further, let's do a poll. I want you to scan this QR code or I'll just, uh, if you can click on this link, go to this link and answer this question. Are you okay to spend a big part of your hard-earned money as transfer charges? Let's take a let's take twenty seconds to un, to get the answers. So I am checking the answers here. So yeah, that is that is what I think I was expecting as well. Uh, none of us want to share the the money that we are earning to go into the transfer charges. That's that's correct. Just to add to this, I added a fun fact here. So according to World Bank, in twenty sixteen. Migrants across the world sent an estimated $574 billion US dollars to their native countries. $574 billion. If you convert that into Indian rupees, I can't even pronounce this word. I, I can't even, I, I don't even, I, I don't know how to pronounce this number. That's a lot of money. So that's how. IBM came into picture and created this product, Wordwire. So what is Wordwire? So this was launched in April 2019. It's a network provider for global payments. It, as of now, it has touched uh, 72 countries and is capable of uh, exchanging uh, 48 currencies. It's integrating the transaction tasks on a single unified platform for both clearing and settlements and payment messaging. And of course, since it is uh, uh, it's built on blockchain, so it reduces the banking intermediaries. Let's see how it works. So any any institution who wants to use this, uh, they, they connect uh, to IBM Worldwide through the APIs. And once they are uh, connected, they can easily make the uh, uh, cross-border remittances and payments. This converts the, uh, fin uh, the digital the uh, fiat currency into digital token like a stable coin. Now, what is a stable coin? A stable coin is, if you uh, if you think of it, uh, think of it like it's a it's a acting as a bridge between uh, the two currencies that are being transferred. Uh, say, uh, as we take the previous example, say you're sending money from UK to India. So, uh, the net uh, the, the currency pair of uh, pounds and uh, Indian rupees. This is, these are the currency pair and the stable coin acts as a bridge in conversion of those two currencies. Say you go to the bank, you go to Lloyd's Bank in UK, send, uh, you give the instruction of say, sharing thousand pounds. The bank converts those uh, thousand pounds into X amount of uh, digital currencies in, in stable coins. And then those uh, X amount of stable coins 
are sent back to the uh, to your native place say in india and they are converted into the x amount of uh, stable coins are converted into equivalent rupees so let's take how let's see how the transaction complete over here so the the the, the settlement uh, the worldwide product converts the a stable coin into instantly into the second currency and all the transactions are being recorded onto a blockchain which is immutable and it helps in a real time clearing of the transactions what are the benefits of wordwire as we have discussed already the clearing and settlement can happen in near real time it's much faster the transaction the, the funds can be transferred at a, at a fraction of cost than as compared to the traditional banking system the stable coin they act as the agreed upon store of value exchange between the two currencies so just and i like to highlight a little more about stable coins over here so stable coin is 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 a digital currency it's not a cryptocurrency per se but it has the properties of a cryptocurrency that is it is uh, the, the you can make the payment uh, faster it allows for peer to peer payment it allows for traceability and immutability and secondly it is pegged to a traditional asset say to the price of gold or say us dollar so it uh, it, it separates out the uh, fluctuation and the volat volatility that is associated with the uh, cryptocurrency so in the nutshell a stable coin gives you the best of both worlds it gives you the uh, the, the swiftness the uh, traceability transparency of a cryptocurrency and it also take gives you the stability of a traditional asset say a us dollar or a price of gold and all these transactions are being stored on a blockchain which helps in future auditability you know you can easily track the transaction it maintains that transparency and traceability and everything is uh, easier to audit that is about uh, ibm blockchain word wire let me take you to the second example let's talk about central bank digital currencies now according to federal reserve the central bank of the united states traditional money comes in two forms uh, it comes in reserves and cash central bank digital currency or cbdc as we call it is the third variant a cbdc is is a digital token or an electronic record that represents a nation's currency it is uh, issued and managed by the country's central bank and it can be used for a, a variety of purposes like uh, peer to peer transfer merchants can use it financial institutions can use it over the period of time in the, in the last uh, couple of years or so a lot of cbdc projects have gained traction and a lot of projects have moved from prototype to pilot stages and into production bcom is the project that we're going to talk about today Bitcoin uh, in Cambodia. So, as of twenty twenty one, it has already reached uh, a penetration of two hundred thousand users, which has uh, which have already uh, done more than one point four million transactions, which in uh, in in the monetary form exceed five hundred million US dollars. So let's learn more about Bitcoin. So, what was Project Bitcoin? So uh, it was sponsored by National Bank of Cambodia and it was developed by Soramitsu. It's the first of its kind retail banking system using blockchain technology in the world. Bitcoin is creating a fiat-based digital currency. Bitcoin is the name of the token that uses uh, the, the fiat currency of Cambodia is Khmer Real, and that is used to create this digital token called Bitcoin. The pilot went live in 2019 and ran successfully with more than 10,000 users. Uh, as of now, uh, as I just told, it's uh, it, it surpassed 200,000 uh, users. So why did we need it? What was the problem in Cambodia? So more than three fourths of the population in uh, Cambodia was still unbanked till the time this project was launched. Its native currency uh, Khmer Real was stable for quite some time, but people there still prefer to use us dollars so there was a incentive there was a, a, the national bank of cambodia was thinking of ways how they can you know infuse power back into their native currency so that people can uh, use uh, uh, their native currency itself and rather than focusing on the foreign currency 
So they came up with a plan. They, they created a digital token, the COM. This new platform would be the way forward to move around the digitized cash. Individuals could pay through their smartphones, peer-to-peer -peer payments, uh, making payments to merchants. Merchants would rely less on the cash. Uh, banking reconciliation would be easier. The high cost of interbank transfers would have reduced. So this was the plan and that's how, uh, with this plan, they created this application. How does it work? It's very simple. You just have to download the app. Download the app. Uh, everybody, since most of the people have an app, they will download the app, and then uh, there's an AI uh, algorithm that matches. You upload your ID card, and you uh, upload your selfie. There's an AI algorithm that matches the uh, your selfie with your ID card, and the customer as the citizen's identity verification is done. Then the user can associate with one of the member banks. They can use Bakong to buy and sell assets, make transfers through P2P uh, channels. And also one thing which I felt, which is my favorite, is the map view of the merchant is available. You open the app, you go onto the map, and it will break, uh, trace your location, it will track your location, and it will give you options of you know, uh, which all merchants uh, in your vicinity use uh, this app and wherein you can pay using Bakong token. So that's something which is uh, which was quite uh, uh, a, revel a, revel a revelation for me. The benefits. So it first, first of all, it serves as an e-wallet. You don't need to have a bank account. You can use uh, this uh, app as your uh, uh, e-wallet. The individuals can just have, a, they, they'll have their, their own QR code. You can show your QR code to uh, allow uh, accepting payments, making payments. For merchants, uh, cashless transactions became possible, so they have they had to rely less on cash. For banks, uh, the high cost of interbank transfers was reduced. It is fast and re reliable. Like no, uh, a general transaction takes less than five seconds. So it's very reliable and fast. And since being on blockchain, it did mitigate uh, the all the single points of failure and hence increase the overall security of the system. And now, uh, as as I've uh, Come to know, like no, the uh, more people in Cambodia are switching back to transacting through uh, Khmer Real and using Bakong. So that's a good sign. So that is about uh, Bakong. So these are the two use cases that I wanted to highlight, wherein uh, I, I felt blockchain has really made an impact in the financial industry. That would be all from my side. Uh, thank you. You can scan this QR code to connect with me over multiple channels. Uh, that would be all from my side. Uh, Prabesh, over to you. I hope you guys like the session. So thank you, Ananzi. So it was very nice presentation from you. So I learned a lot. So without uh, any delay, I would like to welcome our next speaker, our Mr. Pranam Sakya, who is a FinTech professional with a background in blockchain payments and tokenomics, having worked in token forex platforms in Shanghai and Malaysia, developing strategies and algorithm in Solidity. So he is currently involved in projects and research at F1 Soft and uh, Bay Hang University respectively. So allow me to welcome our next speaker, uh, Pranamya Sakya. So you can take over now, Pranamya. Sure, uh, thank you for the introduction. So good evening, everyone. Um, I'm very grateful to Isatya and uh, Nepal Blockchain Foundation for this opportunity. Uh, so basically, starting off, uh, I think uh, from our previous speaker, you brought a very general overlay of uh, how blockchain works, how it is influencing the fintech system. Uh, now, I would like to take a more um, in-depth um, stand to how we view blockchain in the fintech sector. So for that, I will just start my presentation right away. Okay. So to begin off, uh, blockchain-led fintech um, is actually blockchain that is diving into the fintech market itself. So fintech is, as you all understand, it's quite a big industry. It makes a lot of money for the, their respective economies. So it has a large influence in the government, in the private sector, even in the social sector as well. So in that regard, blockchain diving into the fintech market uh, is eventual, and I believe in it being a driving force in the future as well. So moving on, uh, for today's context, uh, I've just summarized uh, my presentation up into these six segments. Obviously, our previous speaker has mentioned blockchain. 
So uh, I take a different approach to why blockchain is important, especially for banking system. Uh, so to begin off, uh, I'll start with uh, peaking curiosity. Why blockchain? Uh, especially from a personal viewpoint, why do I feel that blockchain uh, is the next thing? Uh, apart from that, why blockchain uh, is relevant for BFIs, that is the financial system it's in, in itself. Uh, the potential use cases, um, why blockchain meeting banking is a revolution. Uh, implementation of tokenomics and uh, finally digital currencies. Okay, so to move off uh, a little background on my uh, me myself. Uh, actually, I started off uh, back in 2016 when uh, it was actually a buzz buzzword, right? Exactly, Bitcoin and uh, other Ethereum and even Doge coins were not really the main thing, but the entire blockchain ecosystem was just starting off back then. And uh, companies like Binance were taking over. So through some of the subsidiaries that were in Shanghai, I actually had got a chance to work at a subsidiary of Binance. And uh, from there, I really took my first dive into uh, blockchain technology in general. Uh, apart from that, uh, moving on, uh, I also realized that uh, fi finance really had the backing, they had the infrastructure, and they had the interest in blockchain technology. So some fintech companies uh, that were based off in Shanghai and even Malaysia, especially Trail Technology, was actually launching a token uh, for trading purposes. And uh, I got my first dive into blockchain from there. Uh, similarly, I am also involved in an incubator that is uh, part of China Accelerator. That's an incubator program for startups that work in Web3 tokenization and smart contracts. So that was me uh, back in 2016. And from then onwards, I've been involved in blockchain. Now, why blockchain is relevant? So obviously, since you're all here, I understand that most of you are quite interested in why blockchain is relevant for the FinTech sector. But uh, I think uh, taking a step back, you have to realize that um, money in itself, the concept of money is different to a lot of people. So when money started off back in Rome, or if you'd have it other way, back in China, uh, when coins started off, it wasn't actually that, oh, coins uh, are valuable. They were just a medium to exchange uh, goods and services, basically. So the concept, the core functionality of money remains the same, right? But uh, over the years, it has changed. People have actually uh, tried to store it as value. So they've collected assets, uh, obviously, uh, some of our audiences must also invest in uh, the share market, right? So in that sense, it has become uh, not only uh, a medium to exchange goods and services, but also to retain value over time. But that has not always been the case. Uh, as you can see in the slide, uh, the current financial system is run by BFIs, regulators, and is mostly centralized. So obviously, if you were to follow um, central banks, especially the US, right? So they regulate their currency quite a bit and that also influences the entire global uh, market as well. So in that sense, now the concept of money itself has changed. And uh, now wholesale payments, retail payments, automatic clearing houses, there are lots of intermediaries that actually invest uh, in the technology. And this technology is being sold at high prices to the regular customer. So there's, I believe, a way work around around it, and I believe blockchain could be that. So, moving on, uh, when banks and financial institutes, uh, when they first heard about blockchain, or when they came into the realization that blockchain might have the solution to their problems, they basically looked at these four things uh, to reduce cost. Obviously, the case of cybersecurity, the depending dependency on cash, and to upgrade their financial technology in itself, right? So obviously when banks started out, uh, any bank would like to increase their profit. And in that sense, um, cross-border payments, charges for, let's say regulators, you know, securities, trading costs, all of those could be reduced um, in the blockchain ecosystem. And uh, that is a very attractive point for a lot of banks and financial institutes. Uh, apart from that, we are in the digital age and uh, well, cybersecurity has a very key role to play in any um, any sector, not only in banking, but let's say, even if you were to buy something online, you 
are somewhat worried about your own private security or your personal data being leaked. So banks and financial institutes are obviously aware of that. And apart from that, cash dependencies and uh, updating finance is a large part of why banking or the funding that's being given into banks is being directed to blockchain development or blockchain technologies. Uh, now here uh, <clears throat> in this slide, I can basically see three sections, right? Uh, if you were to zoom in or if you just to sec see the information economy, uh, I believe a lot of us or a lot of the audience here grew up in this info economy where we can see Yahoo, Netscape, Microsoft, Internet Explorer. These are actually the invent of technology. They started off the, let's say, the internet era or the information era, right? Later on came platforms. And even now we are in the platform era where Facebook, YouTube, uh, in our sense, Amazon, right? These platforms earn the bulk of uh, the money. A lot of people are actually involved with this uh, technology. And uh, well, they are the buzz of the current generation. But what would be the future? So looking at the third section here, it's tokens that I believe would be the future. So blockchain, the technology in itself can store value. It can retain that value. And uh, most of all, that value is um, independent. As in, once you have access to it, it becomes yours. And no one else can change it um, without having the 51% hack, right? So in its sense, a uh, digital ledger is so pragmatic and utilitarian in its own right, that it's actually a stable, a cornerstone for the banking industry, and it would be very irrelevant not to use it. Okay. So moving on, um, what would be the potential cases for uh, fintechs or let's say financial domain, financial systems? So today, a lot of commercial banks, central banks, stock exchanges, all are very keen players and are investing heavily in blockchain because they see that potential. So even looking into these statistics, you can see 24 countries. Uh, and I believe India is one of them. Uh, I'm not sure Nepal is, but uh, yes, 24 countries are actively investing in blockchain. 90 corporations, the likes of IBM, Visa, MasterCard, they all accept some form of cryptocurrency or some form of stable coins at the moment. And about 2,500 blockchain patents have already been issued to multiple companies. 100 plus central banks are in discussion of blockchain and over 300 plus tech startups, okay? So these numbers actually give you a very general idea of what's happening in the FinTech domain, but it's also, um, it actually gives you an insight of what is to come, you know? So a lot of things are happening. Um, as of right now, if you see the use cases of why blockchain could be uh, integrated into the current markets, these are the main four things uh, that uh, banks or financial institutes look at. Payments, commercial banking, capital markets, and supply chain. So obviously these are uh, not only the pain points for some of these institutes or central banks, but these are the places where they invest heavily and most of their uh, revenue are generated from these sect sectors. So in payments, uh, micropayments, retail payments, wholesale payments, or even peer-to-peer -peer payments, all of these actually um, are a part of the ecosystem that blockchain can support. So in that very general sense, once a block is created and it can be transferred to another wallet in the very general sense, once that is transferred, there is a very uh, strict ledger as in no one else can interfere with that transaction. So in its finality, the transaction is made. That is not always the case uh, in our current infrastructure where obviously you use mobile banking and you transfer money to someone. Sometimes something breaks, right? So that that case or that scenario can be totally avoided uh, if the entire structure were to move into DLTs, that is distributed ledgers. Um, in that same sense, commercial banking as in um, real estate tracking, physical asset registration, real-time loaning, so all of these can be very technical terms, but in its essence, uh, what that means is anything that is in the physical world can be replicated through blockchain in the digital world as well. Uh, same goes for capital markets, but for capital markets, it's more in the real time. As in, if you've ever traded in the stock market, you do realize that sometimes clearing could be hassle. Right now, a lot of uh, 
companies do invest heavily in networks that uh, maintain microseconds or even uh, at most a second of delay between transactions. So even a second is too much. But if we were to move into blockchain ecosystems, that would actually reduce the time even further and it would make it more concrete through hyperledgers, right? And obviously there is monitoring and surveillance that can also happen through smart contracts. Uh, now, if, if we move into supply chain, it's pretty much the same thing, but now uh, to the decentralized network that blockchain provides, uh, no one person is liable for the entirety of the chain. So the entire system can be decentralized, everything can be tracked real time. And so these are mostly the use cases that banks look into uh, when they try to invest into FinTech. Um, now here I have a very technical overview of where blockchain stands in the uh, current uh, scenario. So obviously at the top application layer, all these are services that uh, uh, financial institutes provide or in the general sense, the general public does use. Uh, but in the middleware or the services section, you can see there are API integration platforms that support it, development or services that have in the background. All of these are the traditional way of doing things. But when smart contracts come into the picture, you can see that there could be public domains or private domains or public keys or private keys that can be integrated into the middleware that would uh, basically create uh, the uplift to support the application and solutions uh, at the top layer there. So basically uh, the smart contracts through the application of distributed ledger could support the entire framework that is um, currently being um, handled by the traditional banking system. So um, here I have a very apparent prompt here. Information stored in blockchain is far easier to audit, making it attractive for companies hampered by administrative costs and those working in sectors with heavy regulatory burden. Uh, a large part of this comes from the fact that entries on the blockchain are inherently trustworthy. So indeed, once a transaction has completed, there's no way to re reverse it. So that uh, in itself becomes a trustworthy transaction. And even with integration of smart contracts, it becomes something that is always permanent on the block. Okay, now, um, enough of the hardcore things. Now moving into the main general sense of why blockchain meeting banking is a perfect amalgam or a match made in heaven. Uh, actually, a lot of uh, media right now pit blockchain against traditional banking, uh, as in traditional banking uh, is opposed to blockchain or cryptocurrencies in general, but uh, the entire technology. But in reality, blockchain can solve some of the most critical issues in the banking industry. Um, so in, in a sense, uh, there is a need to embrace blockchains, immutable smart contracts, real-time financing transactions, and dispute settlements. Apart from that, a lot of other things that can be integrated all come through blockchain, and banking obviously uh, would, stands to benefit from that. So uh, going into the technical depth of it, obviously I will not be reading all this, but uh, if uh, some of you are already familiar with the entire attributes of blockchain, reading through this from a financial point of view, it seems uh, why hasn't uh, the current banking system realized this or why do people not adopt blockchain in the first place? So obviously uh, cryptocurrencies and uh, the entire section of stable coins, uh, CDBCs, have distracted banking from the main core of blockchain technology. But if you were to read through all of this, you would realize that actually the attributes that blockchain provides, the permanence, the immutability and irreversibility of a transaction, uh, the general consensus that once you have ownership of an asset, it becomes yours. That entire structure has been missed by a lot of uh, people and the individual on an individual level uh, to realize this um, uh, like, to realize this is actually the best way to uh, dive into blockchain and make the most benefit out of it. Um, so now um, moving into the main things that uh, DLT or blockchain provides. So this quite interests me or excites me in a way. Uh, obviously smart contracts, ICOs, decentralized finance, these are all hot topics. 
Uh, but today I'll only be looking into two things that I've personally worked on or researched on. That would be the token economy and uh, CDBCs. So obviously our previous speaker has also mentioned CDBCs, but my perspective on it is a little different. Uh, and uh, I do believe there are other ways to change the entire concept of money. Okay. Um, so the first thing uh, I want to look into is tokenomics. I'm not sure how much of the audience is aware of tokenomics. Uh, I'm not even sure uh, if tokenomics is a buzzword, but uh, tokenomics in general sense is token economics, right? Or tokenization of the financial instruments or services. So when I started off the presentation, I did mention the concept of money. The concept of money in its very core essence was the exchange of goods and services. What if goods and services could be exchanged, but without the concept of money? So that part comes into the tokenization system. What if a service or let's say a physical asset could be tokenized? There would be no need for money at all. Why would you trade money for a token and then the token for a, a good? The token actually, um, basically cuts out the middleman. And in this case, the middleman is money, right? So a blockchain-based uh, utility token system can fully automate the transfer of sensitive information from one person to another, a task that many control-based systems cannot easily perform. So this is something uh, in its very essence, if you read through this, you would realize uh, it doesn't really make much sense. Huh? Right now, people do trade a lot of things online, and uh, money is being digitized. So you don't really see the change there. But imagine if you had the tokens in your wallet, let's say a digital wallet, that token could be traded for anything anywhere in the world. Right now, sometimes some platforms only accept Visa, some accept only, let's say PayPal, right? Some accept uh, WeChat or let's say Alibaba. So this is in itself already centralized. There's a control there that, that a lot of people don't see. So that control can be totally removed through tokenization. Okay, uh, moving on, excuse me. Okay, moving on. Now token can be paired up in, or let's say divided up into three different types of tokens. Uh, the utility kind of token, the real estate kind of token and paired tokens. So instruments that allow investors to gain a certain right or discount in the future are basically utility tokens. So tokenized form of a physical service is basically utility token. An example of this would be game points or redeemable cash or merchandise in airlines. So I'm not sure how what part of the audience uh, is uh, from the gaming community. Uh, right now, people pay cashes for digital, let's say digital merchandise on games. What if tokens were provided for each game point? Uh, you could basically do away with cash and the entire system could be decentralized. So that's utility tokens. Um, uh, so utility tokens in itself uh, has a lot more use cases. I've just summarized it into games and airlines here, uh, but utility tokens can also go as much as let's say physical goods uh, that are perishable. So perishable goods can also be tokenized in that the duration of their usability, let's say if you were to buy a jar of jam uh, that would last like three months, you could tokenize the entire process uh, of the production up till the expiry date. And then each, the, the value of the jam, as in the price of the jam would decrease uh, in terms of uh, how long it has been in the shelves. And as it approaches its, uh, let's say expiry date, the token would basically destroy itself as in the jam goes out of the network and it cannot be sold, right? So that could be done. Um, apart from that, real estate tokens. Uh, real estate tokens could be interesting to a lot of people as well. Uh, actually, I have a use case mentioned right after this slide. Uh, I'll go into it in depth right away. Uh, apart from that, uh, I would look into pair tokens for a lot of blockchain enthusiasts out there. This is something that can be seen very apparently uh, if you ever dived into cryptocurrencies or even uh, know a little about cryptocurrencies, you definitely know about USDT, right? So USDT is basically a paired currency to the US dollar. So one dollar equals one USDT. So this pairing of tokens actually provides a very wide range of use cases all over the world. 
Um, it could range from something as simple as uh, buying online goods. Maybe I want to buy a Spotify account. I'll just use USDT instead of USD, more convenient. I cannot, my access to USDT is restricted based on where I live, but USDT, it's not, right? Um, that could be the very simplest use case. And it could be as complex as cross-border payments where USDT could be transferred uh, instead of USD, which is more bulkier, has more regulations, has more intermediaries. And uh, USDT basically has one intermediary, the, uh, the network itself. So the network will have some charges. Apart from that, it would be um, the most effective way to transfer large sums of money. So that's peer tokens and utility tokens. Now looking into real estate tokens. So um, here I have a very general overlay of what real estate tokens could mean. So a building that costs, let's say, over a uh, hundred million or let's say a hundred thousand uh, dollars per flat, uh, it could actually be broken up and tokenized, as in each section or a square meter of could be tokenized and sold to stakeholders. So these stakeholders could be a general investor, it could be a mutual fund, it could be any sort of institute that has the investment backing to buy uh, the $10 million building, uh, but in blocks. So what this does is as the block, or let's say as the apartment block earns its money through rents, uh, through contracts that it signs with uh, you know, anyone, uh, any businesses, uh, when it earns the money, it can actually be divided up into all the investors equally. Uh, so this is a very attractive use case for uh, specific markets such as uh, Hong Kong, Shanghai, or even um, Singapore, where the housing market is quite constricted. And it could also be the use case for uh, even the countries like India, even in Nepal, where the housing market is quite in a bubble. So the same thing, the tokenization of uh, peer, like uh, real estate tokens can also move into artwork, which uh, you might have heard through NFTs. It could also work through infrastructure, infrastructure projects and even through fine wine. Actually, all these have been uh, implemented in the blockchain or there are use cases in the blockchain. Um, and a lot of people are working on it at the moment. So now the final section here is looking into the future and looking into digital currencies in specific. Um, so a lot of people do talk about digital currencies and they think of, uh, well, crypto coins, right? Cryptocurrencies. Uh, that is not always the case. So there's something called stable coins and there's something called uh, cryptocurrencies, obviously. So some are regulated, some aren't, right? Some are paired with real world assets or they are paired with um, actual currencies. However, some might not even be worth um, you know, the block they're created on. Uh, so there are two different things. Uh, here I will look into CDBCs and decentralized currencies. Uh, well, a CDBC in its very essence is a legal tender that is digitalized. It's uh, basically a clear settlement system where everything can be sold instantaneously, um, but it is centralized, as in a, a government or a central bank does control it. A use case for this is uh, the one you see in the picture. It's the digital yuan in China. As you are all aware, uh, China is a very digitalized society in terms of uh, what they do with their currency. Um, and uh, how they transact with Alipay or with WeChat, uh, with QR payments, right? So in its essence, for countries or economies like that, a digitalized yuan generally makes sense. Basically convert uh, what you have in the physical cash form into a digitalized form. And uh, there you have a CDBC. It's not it, nothing complicated, but it's uh, centralized, right? Uh, now the opposite end of the coin, or let's say the opposite end, you'd find uh, DeFi, which is uh, basically short form to decentralized fintechs or to decentralized finance, right? Uh, in that sense, there could be an alternative to centralized, and that is the decentralized form, which cannot be controlled by any banks or institutes. So um, there could be confusions about cryptocurrencies being def or like decentralized, but uh, that is not the case. 
So decentralized finance eliminates intermediaries by allowing people, merchants, and businesses to conduct financial transactions through emerging technologies. So in its very simplest form, uh, once you are an owner of a decentralized currency, you could think of yourself and, uh, as a maverick, as someone uh, who has full ownership of the currency that they own. It cannot be devalued by one single entity. You are uh, in control of what you do with it. You can trade it, you can buy, trade it for goods and services. You can stake it uh, for rewards. You can do whatever you want with it and no one has control over it. That is not exactly the case for CDBCs. Um, now I have actually differentiated uh, some of the key, um, let's say the key positive points from each section. Uh, so, CDBC is in its very essence is a singular currency. Uh, it's a combination of public and private partnership. It's mostly useful for cross-border payments and uh, it's quite resilient as in a central bank will support it. Uh, it's efficient as in there are networks that are run by the government itself, right? And uh, it's environmentally sustainable. Well, they say it's environmentally sustainable. So these could be uh, use cases for CDBC, but at the opposite end, if it were decentralized, um, it would be that any user identification and privacy could be uh, maintained. So in an essence, if uh, let's say I in Nepal were to trade uh, some goods to a vendor from China or from India, I could trade directly without having any intermediaries in the middle, uh, you know, messing with my business. So that is the best way to transfer money. And uh, it might not be the safest way, but once decentralized finance is stable enough, that could be the use case. Uh, apart from that, it's programmable and uh, it's, it's a safe uh, asset and stress-free. So what that means is uh, basically a currency that is decentralized to its core, no one can control it, means it's also free to be programmable, as in I could uh, basically have $1 paired to one of my crypto, oh, sorry, one of my stable coins and could transfer it anywhere in the world without having issues with uh, that specific regulator or that specific country. It also minimizes the risk of uh, fraud. In this case, the fraud is the 51% hack. And uh, it also is a way to uh, maintain illicit finances, uh, which could not be, um, you know, overlooked. So all in all, uh, through the entirety of this, uh, I would like to summarize in a sense that um, blockchain is here to stay. And obviously fintech is coming to the realization that this is what we they need to do. And there's a lot of investment pouring into it. So if any of our uh, attendees are interested in it, they should definitely look into it. And uh, you can contact me through the LinkedIn uh, QR that I have here or through my emails to get in touch with me regarding um, anything relating to FinTech or in general blockchain. Uh, I do do some consulting. Um, so yeah, feel free to hit me up. Thank you. So thank you, Pranamya. So it was valuable. So now we have some questions in our chat box. So I would like to uh, read some of them. Uh, and uh, so it's our speakers, are you guys ready to answer some questions? Sure. Okay, so first question is from uh, Mr. Tekraz. And he says, with the world wire, how the transaction will be validated and who will validate the transactions? What type of mechanism is it? Uh, what type of mechanism it uses? Proof of work or stake? and how the system is made distributed. So who wants to answer the question? Uh, so yeah, I think it's uh, for me. Uh, so, so blockchain worldwide uses a, a blockchain protocol that's called Stellar. So they have their own consensus protocol called Stellar Consensus Protocol, which is the, a construction of, uh, uh, it's, it's a federated Byzantine agreement uh, in, in sim, sim, if I put it simply, it's uh, it's similar to a proof of stake thing, but it's not exactly the the same thing. Uh, how it is made uh, distributed? The the application itself uh, allows it to be uh, distributed. So like uh, 
say the different banks uh, which are participating in uh, with which are participating with the uh, with this product uh, once the transactions are reconciled once it's uh, the clearing and settlement happens everybody gets uh, gets to have a distributed ledger uh, say like uh, uh, the end of day reports as we say in banking so so that's how the distribute uh, distribution of the ledger information happens uh, they use a stellar thing where, like uh, for, for if, if you know about the different blockchains uh, stellar and uh, ripple are one of the two uh, some of the two uh, blockchains which are extensively used in the financial sector uh, stellar specifically uh, is being used here because it in, it, it uh, boasts of increased uh, throughput uh, it allows for network stability uh, ne network scalability and the low cost of transaction. So uh, I think I did cover the couple of mini questions that were there. So uh, Michael Sidri have something to say. He says, hi Anant, uh, more than global payment and CBDC, I think use cases of blockchain for the trade transaction is more relevant and gathering more pace. So what- Yeah, certainly. Uh, um, so, for for me, I think uh, for for me the, the to focus was on to the the financial domain here. So I did uh, take up use cases in the from the financial domain. But uh, yeah, like uh, the trade finance is also coming up very uh, sharply. Uh, IBM itself has launched a couple of uh, use cases which are in, in already into production. Uh, IBM Food Lens is once then. Uh, uh, Marco Polo is another blockchain community which has launched the entire, you know, uh, like tracking the entire uh, shipments of uh, from from starting from Canada to Australia. So yeah, uh, anything that involves any business that involves multiple hands uh, is a good uh, uh, is a, is a good uh, example where blockchain could be used. So yeah. Uh, now I think uh, this next question is for Pranamya. So uh, Suras Resta says, "It is is it centralized?" I think he's talking about blockchain or what? It's centralized in a sense CBDCs. Uh, Suras, you can turn on your voice and <laughs> clear the. Uh, there's another part of his question. Does Nepal government approve for blockchain to be uh, possible to? The data once it is written. Okay, so I think he's talking, or he basically is referring to BFI as being uh, regulated through the Nepalese Government um, Internet Act. So, uh, well, I wouldn't like to go into the detail, obviously, but uh, Nepal government does not really, um, you know, encourage cryptocurrencies in any way or shape or form. But blockchain. I think uh, through the creation of eSatya or Nepal Blockchain Foundation, it is very relevant that blockchain is a technology and it's not uh, really uh, something that uh, is could be regulated, basically. So it's the same as saying, oh, I'm regulating, let's say, uh, cement manufacturing or let's say the machines that manufacture chipsets. So it's actually a technology. So I guess uh, in the broad sense, if Nepal has to stay ahead of the curve, there's no really a standard uh, to say I would regulate this and I would uh, block this. Um, I do believe uh, it's somewhat, uh, somewhat uh, let's say, backward thinking of the regulators to say uh, cryptocurrency cannot be uh, adapted to the Nepalese uh, eco uh, sorry the economy. So yeah, to answer his question, it is, uh, however regulated in some ways, but the technology itself is not. Yeah. I hope that answers the question. Although it's, uh, I'm not sure what he means by possible to modify the data once it is written. Really sure what that means in which aspect. He means uh, like uh, modifying in blockchain or something. So can you turn on your voice uh, to clarify the question, Mr. Suras? Or he is with us or not? So see him at the best. Anyways, I think uh, it does. Uh, if he's talking about blockchain, uh, obviously, it's not. <laughs> so, but I'm not sure what he's. So Vivek uh, says, "Can we get the slides?" So okay, uh, we'll provide the slides in your uh, mail uh, after uh, like to, uh, like tomorrow or uh, the day 
after that so stay tuned for that so i think this much for the questions uh, so if anyone have any questions so i'll provide you one minute now you can ask otherwise we'll have to end the program uh, She turn on your chats, right? Uh, uh, is that a question? How can okay, we regulate crypto, crypto scams? Okay. Uh, Mr. Anand, would you like to take over with the question? Or? Sure. Uh, okay. So, uh, for first thing first, like uh, there are uh, different forms of scams. So, like uh, there. Uh, the one thing we need to understand is like no uh, any uh, blockchain network say any any chain that is uh, uh, that that has started off so uh, it's it's a for a, how i think is like no when when the chain is new it's uh, relatively new it it is is it is still easier for uh, uh, say uh, malicious participants to you know attack it and uh, make uh, uh, money out of it but as the chain grows older and older, then it becomes uh, really difficult. Uh, so that's one thing. Secondly, uh, how do we regulate it? So the regulation is again, uh, it, it all depends on you know, how, how the network administrators of the, uh, of, of the, of the chain, how, uh, what sort of uh, entry criteria they have put in. And uh, say once everybody, once the uh, people are there in the network, so like, how do they wish to uh, which consensus protocol they, do they want to use say as in uh, say, say we, uh, we have byzantine fault tolerant uh, consensus networks wherein you know uh, it, it's a 51% uh, attack more than 51% attack then the then your blockchain network is compromised so uh, there are different ways of uh, regulating the uh, crypto scams and also there are different scams different sort of scams so like you know uh, we must have we must have heard of uh, the one of the DeFi protocols was uh, hacked quite recently, and a, a lot of money was being uh, taken from it. But then again, uh, it, it was returned back because the the person who the hacker he wanted to be part part of the network. So, yeah, all in all, what I want, all in all, what I can say is like, you know, uh, when when a network chain is new, they, at that point it is still uh, uh, vulnerable to attacks. But uh, as the chain grows older, so like if you want to uh, tamper something in the Bitcoin blockchain, it is uh, quite near to impossible unless you have that uh, the, that sort of uh, computability and the, uh, the the electronic power capability to do that. But otherwise, yeah, uh, they they are uh, pretty stable and reliable. But yeah, you never know. Like with with new things coming up. Obviously, uh, there would be all sorts of people who would be doing that. And that's why we suggest, you know, uh, this sort of a new technology is, is still uh, in its nascent state. And we need regulators and people who can, you know, uh, handhold it and guide it to the right, to reach the right uh, objectives. So I think this answers the question. So now we have come to the end of our program today. So I'd like to thank our speakers, first of all. So you guys have been amazing uh, throughout the entire process. We contact you, you were responsive and uh, today's, perfect, uh, today's slides were pretty informative as well. So I'd like to thank you again for your uh, session and for your valuable time as well. So sure. I'd like to thank the audience as well. So for uh, being, uh, cooperative and asking the questions so now if anyone have uh, more questions regarding the topic you can you guys can contact uh, through our uh, our social media and uh, 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 just one thing uh, Prabish I'd like to uh, thank uh, Pranamya as well uh, I, I never saw, saw the presentation before because it was just uh, it was just done before the session but it was pretty good and it was wonderful to hear from uh, the token uh, tokenomics aspect of it it was something which was uh, which I'm not aware of so far uh, I really enjoyed it thanks a lot for thank you same goes for you like uh, I'm really interested in the CDBC um, uh, ecosystem as well and no. uh, coming from an expert like you it was quite an interesting uh, feat and I really I would really like to connect on uh, CDBCs in general so sure, we, we can connect and we can, yeah. we can have a discussion apart from this so uh, good to connect thanks Pravesh thanks for hosting this
wonderful to thank be you. Here. thank you thank Welcome. you for all of you attending thank you Okay, so we have uh, shared our uh, social media platforms as well as speakers social media platform like uh, LinkedIn uh, in our chat box so you guys can connect uh, uh, there over there so I like to formally end this program right here now so thank you everyone thank you, thank you. Have a great day. we'll meet soon again in our next meetup so sure.